Right, thanks for all coming. It's a graveyard shift on a Sunday. So it's, uh, it's great to see that many people here. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm going to look at um, Ansible, but in a sort of, in a Drupal context, if you like. Um, so I've called it Medicine Show, and with a view to kind of Ansible being one of the new sort of snake oil kind of remedies that's around at the moment that people think can cure absolutely everything. Um, and I'm going to explore that and um, look at that, particularly in a security context, so that's the kind of the flavour of the talk. Um, I'm George, here are my sort of contact details. Um, I work for a company called Blue Bag. We've been doing this sort of thing for over 15 years, but 15 years as Blue Bag. Um, for the last five years we've been wholly doing uh, work in Drupal. And for that last, almost a year I guess, I've been really focusing on looking at Ansible as the way that we manage all of our infrastructure and uh, and, and, you know, and manage our service security and that sort of thing. So the things I'm going to cover today, there are a strong focus on security issues um, and how I use, or how, we, how you should use Ansible for that, and with a sort of focus on um, service security and with a, a, you know, a Drupal context. There's going to be a few take-homes. The main take-homes are about enhanced, enhanced security of your servers, but some of the take-homes include t-shirts, badges, Stickers. So, if you take nothing home from my talk, at least take the T-shirts home because I don't want to. Um, so, Ansible and Drupal. To me, when I when I first came across Ansible, it was when I was looking at um, provisioning tools generally. So, looking into things like Chef and Puppet and Saltstack and that sort of thing. And Ansible really stood out and really grabbed me. And you know, I kind of got into that like I didn't with the others. And one of the things about Ansible, um, I think is a really good mix with Drupal, is that it's got the same sort of open source heritage, it's the same sort of, kind of there's a lot of familiarity that you'll have working in the Ansible community. It's got a strong community, there's a, there's a, there's a whole constellation or a galaxy of uh, modules and roles and playbooks that you can use. Um, and last year, for what it's worth, in the open source, it was, um, you know, it was in good company in the top 10 open source products of last, projects of last year. So it's certainly something which, it's got a lot of traction, a lot of people are getting interested in it, and there's a, you know, a burgeoning community, and I think that's something, from a Drupal perspective, but that's something you know, which we can, we can contribute to as well. And I think certainly in terms of looking at how we can work with Ansible in a Drupal-specific context. When I first thought about doing a talk for this camp, it was when we were in the midst of quite a lot of sort of security issues coming up last year. And, um, in, in, over the last few years, there's been a sort of rise of more and more types of people getting involved in sort of traditional sysadmin roles and getting into the sort of area which we call sort of DevOps and so forth. And if we look at the trends of security in 2014, I've pulled out a, a couple of things that were sort of key um, security issues of 2014. There were issues around um, bash, there were issues around uh, downgrade attacks on SSL, and there were issues around um, exploits for open SSL. And there's sort of these um, common vulnerabilities, um, they're called the common vulnerabilities and exposure numbers, are sort of things which sysadmins would have been aware of and that would have been their vocabulary for years. And one of the things that I noticed that really changed in 2014 was that they all got brandy. <laughs> right? And it wasn't suddenly we were looking through forums for, oh yes, I've seen CVO and CV. It was like, well, shell shot. We'll let on a t-shirt. <laughs> I'm thinking about getting the tattoo. <laughs> that was that to me was quite eye-opening, right? And it what it did to me, it touched on something which I've been aware of and sort of subconsciously aware of, I guess, for quite a while. And that is there was this change from um, a sort of traditional guy with a massive monitor and a gamer's mouse in the, in the basement of an organization, what we were seeing is that with the availability of cloud servers, suddenly everybody was a sysadmin, right? We were all getting, we were all getting servers. We were going on to Rackspace, we were going on to Fastos, we were going on to um, DigitalOcean, what have you, and we've suddenly, no, it's no problem to get a server, right? And the availability of cloud servers and the ease of setup meant there's a proliferation, of, I think, of um, very unsecure servers around, okay? And people are getting servers, they're getting an IP address through, the, through the email with your root password, and they're getting, whoa, and they're getting on and installing <laughs> Drupal and living a happy life. 
And another thing that we, another thing that I, I noticed in the last couple of years, I don't know if any of you've noticed too, is that although we, as soon as you get in, as soon as you get a server, right, you're under attack. You're under attack all the time. You probably don't even know it because you probably don't even look through your logs, but you are. As soon as your IP address is public, you're under attack. But one of the things I've noticed in the last year or so is the, the number of clearly manual attacks that we're getting. Things that traditionally would have been the preserve of automated robots scanning ports, scanning IP addresses, just looping through the whole internet looking for things to exploit. I notice that you know, if you go through your Drupal logs, you'll start seeing things like on contact form submissions on Molem, for example, you'll start seeing, um, although they might be marked as spam for Molem, you'll see that they are actually filling in captures. They are actually doing things which robots traditionally didn't have you know, a great opportunity to solve, although you know, capture solving is you know, a big issue in uh, the malicious exploit world. But, and the other thing that I noticed that was quite clear is that we're seeing waves of attack from constellations of compromised machines, right? So if you go through your SSH logs, which is a fun day out, and you look at what um, passwords people are trying to exploit your SSH on, and these bots come through and they just cycle through IP addresses and they're going, let's just try and log on as root, let's just try and log on as Debian, or let's just try and log on and back up and you know, see what we get and see what we can. Have. What we noticed was that we were getting waves of attacks that had the same signature, and they were quite often attacks against things like intermediate routers on the path, so they weren't even attacking your server, they were looking for um, exploits in routers, so things like you know, D-Link, user and, and things like this, but they were coming through in waves of, with a signature, okay? And all, the, all of these things means that if you have any responsibility for a server, you need to sort of have some sort of understanding of these, and you have to put in some sort of remediation, some sort of mechanism in order to keep your server secure. And with the proliferation of freely available um, servers and you know, any of the providers, that's, that's suddenly it's no longer the responsibility of the people who are giving you the server. If you were on shared hosting, they probably didn't give you access, they probably didn't give you shell access, right? They probably just gave you a C panel access and things like that. And their sysadmin teams, their technical teams, you hope, would have been responsible for locking these sorts of things down. Now, because you've got a virtual team, the, the provider, you know, I say doesn't care, of course they care, but they don't really take responsibility. That responsibility is yours. It's your, it's your responsibility to make sure that all the ports that you make available um, are protected. So when, when we set up um, basic server security, you know, we start having to do the things that sysadmins have traditionally done forever. Um, we, you know, we should operate things, the principle of least privilege. As soon as you get your IP address, you should just lock everything down so that you are the only person with an RSA key that can get onto that server. You should immediately change the root login password and stop people logging as root to your server. You should lock down, you shouldn't have anything on that, on that server that's <coughs> accessible to the public that you don't want to make accessible to the public. If you, if you know, if you, there are ports on your server which don't need to be addressable by the general public. So you need to, you need to have an understanding of um, hardening things like SSH, hardening things like um, using IP tables or other firewalls to lock down access to all ports. You probably have to think about using things like, you know, I mean, one of the issues here is that your clients probably don't want to spend a lot of money, right? They see on one and one they can get a website for a pound, and then you tell them it's going to cost you a thousand pounds a month for hosting. They go, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. But if you do have a good budget for hosting, you know, the, the real big players in the in the um, web application market will use dedicated appliances from companies like Barracuda or Cisco and so forth, or they'll use um, web application firewalls like. Um, CloudFront or Cloudflare and those sorts of things that will do that sort of protection for you. But typically, the sorts of market, the sort of audience, I guess, that I'm looking at are people who have a small number of servers, they have to manage those servers, and they have to keep them secure, um, and probably at the moment you know, don't have the time or the budget to do that in a, in a very manual, um, manual way. Um, so the, the other thing to think about is if, if all that really scares you, then is to consider using a platform provider. Right? Like, um, Acquia or, or, or Platform SH or you know, uh, Pantheon or one of those sorts of people who will take that sort of thing into account. And if we look at the Drupal Geddon exploit, one of the first patches for that was upstream of Drupal in the database layer through um, patching on the providers like Acquia would have done that outside of the context of your Drupal site so you would have been protected immediately. So you know, if, you, if you can't take responsibility for basic service security, that is always something to think about. If you do, have, if you do take responsibility for basic service security, then what, I, what we operate is a thing called the first five. Okay? 
Okay, and this is a, and this is what I'm going to go into later on. But the concept is basically it's quite a common sort of a concept, I guess. And that is that as soon as you've got that publicly addressable IP address, you've got I mean, five minutes is a long time. But people say this is the thing that these are the things that I do in the first five minutes of, of getting that server. Okay, and so that's what we're going to look at a bit later on. We're going to look at the how Ansible is going to help us do that and do it in five seconds or under five minutes, but not take a whole day of going through our server build spec in Google Docs or whatever it is, or you know, looking through the shell scripts that we've written previously and following manual, manual steps to secure our server, which we probably never do the same twice. And it's fine on one, well, it's a bit of a pain on two, but then you've got, you know, like that talk, went to a, who went to the talk yesterday on um, the Katari in library site where they had you know, 21 servers, right? You don't want to go and do 21 servers manually, all with different types of configurations, it's just a non-starter, right? But if I think if you have one server, you need to do that. Okay, and we're going to look at how Ansible um, can help us in that. So I'm going to just cover a few basics um, of Ansible. Um, as I say, when I first came across Ansible, I came across it very much with a view to it being a provisioning tool, right? So setting up um, server, setting up, you know, Apache or setting up MySQL or what have you, and through products like um, Vlad, where it sets up a, a whole um, whole Drupal environment. But the more I've used it, the more I've come to see it much more as an IT automation system. And provisioning, obviously, is IT automation, but it does, and you can do so much more. So, if you do anything in scripts, you know you can consider doing it um, through Ansible. One of the things that it's like um, one of the things people always say about Ansible, it's a matter of personal opinion whether it really is its greatest strength, but one of, one of the good things about it is that it's agentless. You don't have to install anything on your server in order to be able to use Ansible on that server. <coughs> often, often. <It's, coughs> which doesn't come, for, it doesn't come out of the box in all distributions. Most, most it does, but there's just something, <coughs> something better. But it's agentless, so it's not like Chef or Puppet where you have to have a client running on the server. Any server that you have SSH access to, you can use Ansible um, to do things on. From a Drupal's perspective, um, it's, it's, Python, um, it's Python based, it's open source, so you can go and see how it does what it does. But all the configuration you do for um, Ansible it uses YAML. That's another attractive thing, right? We're all going to be upgrading our sites to Drupal 8 soon, um, <clears throat> and we're not learning a different type of text format, <laughs> if you like. You know, we're using YAML, and that's something. But although it uses the Ginger templating engine or the Twig templating engine, Curly brackets, very familiar, text files, all very similar. And, and having said that, um, it uses a whole range of uh, modules that you can use. It comes with a load of modules that you can do an amazing amount of things out of the box. There are a lot of contributed modules and things that you can get hold of, and you can, they're open source, so you can go and see how they do what they do, and you could write your own. You can write Ansible modules in any language that returns JSON. The reality is the Ansible community would like you to do it in Python. <laughs> but there are people out there bravely trying to write um, Ansible modules in PHP, and there are libraries to enable you to do that. But we're going to look at that later on when we look at it in a Drupal context as to whether you actually need to write a, a module or whether you just need to interact with it with JSON, which you could do through um, Drupal. So. And I said it's open source, and I said don't think of it just for provisioning, think of it for IT automation. So I'm going to just run through a couple of goals, and these are sort of um, relevant to myself and, and how we use Ansible, but I think they're relevant to anyone that wants to get into Ansible from a, a Drupal perspective, managing uh, Drupal infrastructure. Um, one of the things I really like Ansible is it, it you know, gets rid of the need for us to log into servers. If you find yourself SSHing into a server as you, if you find yourself doing it as root, close the server and go home. If you find yourself doing it, if you find yourself doing it as yourself, you know, why not actually do it as Ansible, get it locked down so that you have a key that, and, and you know, don't allow people to SSH into the servers themselves. Do it through Ansible. There's very little that, there's very little need for you to do that if you start using Ansible. Anything that you write a script for, if you write scripts for R syncing things or you know, secure copying things up to servers using SSH or tunneling to SSH or whatever, don't, you can use Ansible for that. Um, I haven't come across anything actually that we used to use bash scripts for. I don't use them at all now. Uh, do everything in, in Ansible. The light bulb moment for me is 
I probably have to say to myself, why are you using Ansible for this? Not, <coughs> why aren't you? I probably, I should have done the talk in Ansible. Yeah. Um, <coughs> The other thing about it is that um, when we, when all of us who do um, server builds at some point will will write that server build up in a document, right? And it's a you know, document that you'll follow, and it's steps you follow, you must remember to do this and do this. If you use Ansible, it is self-documenting. Um, you can put it in source control. You can share that amongst um, your team members. It's also I've invented Moxy Woody Bucks, which <laughs> is something you'll hear a lot of. But the, that's a real key of Ansible is that it's idle open, which means that if the tasks that you write are unimportant, it means you can run them again and again, and it won't make changes if changes aren't necessarily, if, if they're not needed to be made, right? So if you have an Ansible job that copies a file from your local machine to a remote server, it will check first if that file is on the local server, it will, on, on the remote server, it will hash that file, it will hash your local file, it will compare those hashes and say, oh, I don't need to do that, and it'll say, no need to do it. You can override that. You can put force to say, I, I do want you to do it. But that's great because it means that scripts that you know you think, oh no, I've run that script before. <laughs> you know, what's that going to do? You suddenly don't have that sort of problem. And it's very, very easy to use. So when you write your playbooks in Ansible, you should just be able to run them whenever you like without it you know, making changes that you're not expecting it to make. The other thing it does is it enables you and it starts forcing you to keep an inventory, you know, keep a, keep a note of all your inventory, right? That it keeps you, you have these host files and inventory files so that you can document all of these sites that you're dealing with, all their IP addresses, you don't have to worry about all the SSH keys, there's no need for secure notes that you keep all over the place in some password protected thing, you know. It's all nicely kept in Ansible and you just use it so you don't have to start worrying about the IP address of this server. And it's one of those things you hear a lot in Ansible talks about. Is changing servers from pets to cattle, right? I think it's a bit unfortunate. I think <laughs> you should treat cattle better than that. But it stops servers being important. Right? It stops you thinking, oh my god, you know, that server is a bit creaky, it's a bit groany, what are we going to do if something's about building a new one? You just build a new one. You don't, you know, and it's built the way you like it and you can throw it away. And you suddenly no longer have this precious attitude to individual servers. So you know, they become cheap. They become cheap. They are cheap. The expense of a server is the heartache you have thinking you might have to rebuild it if it got, you know, if it went down or just failed or something like that. So yeah, they're cheap. But it also retains your knowledge, right? So you, when everyone builds a server, at some point they become an expert on how to install APC, and they become an expert on how to configure Apache, and they become an expert on, and then two weeks later, they go, well, what the fuck, did I write that? I don't know, you know. If you use Ansible, it documents that knowledge, and, it, and you can, and if you version control it, you can improve that over time, and that's, that's a massive time step. You don't have that, that that industry knowledge, that practical knowledge that you have in the way that you set up these things for your own configuration. It's no longer lost you know, in, in the sort of vaporware that is your brain. Get the book, right? I'm not going to cover anything in depth. Right? This book does. This book is an excellent book. It's written on Lean Pub by Jeff Geerling. He's a Drupal developer, so he writes in a way that Drupal developers understand. Very, very clear. I've tweeted a voucher code so that you don't have to worry about copying this long thing down. But get the book, it's a really good book. Um, it's definitely worth supporting. He covers a lot of really good topics in there. He covers building things on you know, automatic provisioning on a whole range of different cloud services, for example. He looks at Drupal specific stuff, and it's so I, I fully recommend the book, and I've certainly pitched a lot of examples out of it for the talk today, so I've got to plug it, otherwise it's a copy theft, right? Um, <laughs> there's loads of examples. Ansible is an amazingly well documented product, right? Um, go to GitHub, there are very, very good examples of how things, how you can do things. You can take those examples and use them and build them for your own purposes. They're really, really good. The Ansible documentation itself is excellent. There's some very clear guidelines about best practices, which is a really good way of learning how to do things um, that works well for you. Um, and there's Ansible Galaxy, which is a way of you getting hold of pre-built roles so that you don't have to keep reinventing the whip, right? So you don't have to work on how to do these things. and you. Typically, you go and look how they did it and then write your own, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's, yeah. yeah, I've started Googling for Ansible. <laughs> yeah. I just can't stand Galaxy's interface. No, Galaxy's interface isn't great. But, um, Usually, they tell you the Galaxy name in the GitHub documentation. Exactly, anyway. yeah, and you go to GitHub and, and go from there. But no, it's just to know that it exists is, is, is really yeah. good. Um, I don't have time. So Ansible breaks down into a number of key areas. Again, I'm not going to cover these in great detail, but it's worth just reiterating that it does base everything around an inventory so that you know what your IP address is and your SSH user names that you're using and the keys that you're going to use to log into your servers. It's based around a series of commands and modules which you can use for copying files, 
all the way through to provisioning onto cloud services. You typically write things um, based around roles. In, use, in your YAML files, if you file the YAML files that you're building for an Ansible job, get more than a screen's height, split it up into different things, split it up into roles. Roles get split up into tasks, and we'll have a look at that in a minute. It uses templates, which is great, so that you can um, have standard templates for things like the way that you like the vhost file to be set up, or the way that you like a, um, a pa any, you know, any, any configuration file to be set up, so that you don't have to keep hard coding things. It, it, largely based around facts, when Ansible first connects to your, uh, any of your remote servers, unless you tell it not to, it goes off and it gathers everything it needs to know about that server. The most commonly used bit is what the operating system is. And you can say, you know, when it's Debian, use APT, or when it's CentOS, use YUM, or, you know, and you can have conditional tasks based around the differences in between different distros that you may have on your servers. You don't have to write different playbooks, different tasks for different, um, well, you have different tasks, right, because they're conditional, but you don't have to write whole different playbooks for provisioning different types of servers on different, um, and it's based around variables, variable substitution is very powerful, we'll look into that, and you can also group variables by hosts and by, um, by groups of hosts, so you can have variables that you apply to groups of servers in your inventory, like they, these are my web servers, these are my database servers, this, this group is all my servers, and so you can have different things that apply to those different types of servers. Certainly, obviously, what packages you want to install on them, but you might have different memory requirements or you know, other infrastructure requirements for those different types of servers. Ansible modules cover, out of the box cover, a vast range of different things. There's two that typically you should wonder why you use which is just being able to, use, to run a, a command or run a shell command on the server. Typically, you would say, I'd like to avoid that, but they're there if you can't think of any other way of, of doing it. Um, one that you'll use a lot is things like line and file, which uses reg, sorry, go. Oh, no, it's just interesting. If you use command and shell, often it'll give you a warning if there's mm. a better way to do it. Yeah, in Ansible. exactly. It's one of those things if you find yourself doing it. But you're using the file. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's line and file, which enables you to substitute individual lines in a file based around the regular expression which you use. So if you want to, and I'll show you an example of doing that for patching a security issue later on. Um, that's, that's, that's really valuable. File for uh, creating files, copy, unarchive, you can take, put up a whole archive onto the server um, and, and unarchive it. Obviously things like um, patch management, enabling disabling modules in Apache, a whole range of different things. Things that would be interesting to us from a Drupal perspective, if we're looking at using Ansible for continuous integration, are the fact that it's got good interfaces with Git, that you can provision, uh, straightforward provision on things like DigitalOcean or Rackspace or Amazon. And also, from a local development point of view, there are interfaces with package managers like Homebrew. So, some real nerdy people use Homebrew, and use uh, Ansible to build the whole map, the whole local development environment. It also works really well um, with Vagrant. Okay. Um, and here's a, I don't really want you to sort of read any of this really particularly, but what, I, what I've got here is just an example of that in, in an empty folder on your local development machine, assuming that it's a, a Windows machine, well, not, not, not a Windows machine, um, a, so I've got an empty folder here with demo, and I'm just going to plop in one file, a Vagrant file, and all this Vagrant file does is configure Vagrant to build me three virtual machines, which I'm going to call one app one, App2 and DB. It's in Jeff's book. This example, I've changed it slightly to use DB as opposed to CentOS and changed a couple of other things. But you can create a three virtual machines running from this folder. You can create a host file which groups those by um, application servers. So these two application servers, this one's a DB server. You can group those groups to say that you know I have a multi group which is kind of all of them. And I can set up variables um, to apply to those different. Groups. So it's like the standard any file syntax, right? I'm familiar with that. Um, and what that enables us to do is we say Vagrant up, we've got three virtual machines on our local machine. And then using Ansible, we can just do really simple commands. We can say, using Ansible comes in two commands, right? Ansible will run any command you want it to run. Typically, we'd run a thing called Ansible Playbook, which it will use a script file to specify which commands to run. But it's just like the basic way of using Ansible. So I can just say Ansible using the group multi, which in this case is my, all three of my servers, using the inventory file hosts, so that you know what that group is and what their IP address is, I just want you to run a command saying um, freem using the user vagrant, right? That's, so that's 
all I need to do in those, those two files and that one line. And that will give me the free memory of the three servers. It's not great. We know what memory we gave them in the first place, right? <laughs> that, 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 that could be a host file that points to a thousand digital ocean droplets, right? And you can go and you could write your playbooks based around those facts that you've gathered. All these would be in the Ansible facts if you gathered the facts. It would tell you which um, of your app servers are running out of memory or you know, running out of disk space or whatever, or don't install this meaty great big thing on this server, it hasn't enough space, right? But it's that simple, that's all you need. You don't need um, a large number of configuration files. Typically though, you would do other things. You would add uh, an Ansible configuration file, okay, which would say, I want you to log the output of what you do, and I want, I'm going to tell you where the host file is, so I don't have to keep putting that in the, in the, in the command line. Um, I'm going to log it, and there's my host file. So, the same line then says, well, we don't need to keep saying where the host file is, we don't need to keep saying um, which user I'm going to run. So it starts becoming a little bit more succinct, right? I can just say things like Ansible, multi, tell me what the data is on all my servers. I want to see that my servers are all in sync, right? I could say things like um, Ansible on all my servers uh, using sudo, I want you to run the module, apt, package manager module, um, and pass it the arguments that, that I want it to, um, concerning the package network time protocol, NTP, I want you to make sure it's installed. And it will go through all of the servers, I'm going to show you one, because recently for those, it will go through all those things and say, yeah, it wasn't installed, I did do that. Uh, there were no errors, but the standard out garbage that came from the package manager was all this, <coughs> which you'll typically ignore. Um, and it will tell you at the end whether or not it installed it or not. And if you want to, and if you do, if I ran that again, it would say change equals false, and it won't have to do it because it would check to see that that package was installed before it tried to do it again. We don't want to keep writing things on the command line. We don't want to keep having to remember what all the parameters are when we type them in the command line. So typically, we break it down using a playbook. And what a playbook does is it breaks that command line down into what we call a task, and it will give you, tell you what host you want to use it, whether you want to gather facts, whether you want to use sudo, so you don't have to put all those parameters in. And you use a task, and a task basically you give it a name, and the only reason you do that really is so that in your log file it shows you what that task is, so that when you review that for errors you can identify it. And you say, I want you to use the app module, and I want you to pass it these parameters. Okay? And that's typically how you would do that. You wouldn't typically write Ansible and run a Python command. So when you start doing that, if you start looking at the best practices of how to structure your um, Ansible roles, uh, one of the really useful things is using a thing called Galaxy init. So you've got to write a new role. If you type Galaxy init in your folder, Galaxy init my role, it will give you the stub for the whole of that role. Okay? Saves you creating a load of directories by hand, saves you creating a load of files by hand, saves you remembering to put uh, dash 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 at the top of all your YAML files and that sort of thing. And it puts them in a structure which Ansible uses for auto discovery. So you don't have to keep writing includes for the variable files. Ansible knows to look in the variables folder for the variables file. It makes it the whole thing much um, quicker to do, right? Got five minutes, yeah? <laughs> the clock's ticking. Well, you probably got to it tonight, to be honest. <laughs> um, I found that the same um, is true of the whole project structure. So I've put on GitHub just my take on a whole project. So if you're going to start a whole new, if you're going to start a new Ansible playbook, just copy this, and it will give you the whole directory structure for a whole of an Ansible playbook with everything you need, with a dummy role in it called base, and that you can just use that. So you can, you've got out of the box then something, you can then just tinker with the details of what it is you want to do, like filling in the host files, filling in the variables, what your inventory is, and so forth. Another really useful thing to remember is that you do need to test your playbooks, right? Um, you know, if you've got 10,000 digital ocean droplets, and you go, oh, I'm going to have to run that playbook on them. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because you've got an error in the playbook, because there's a little bit of white space in one of the YAML files. Get used to running things like syntax checks, you list the tasks, you can see which task is actually running, you might think, oh, I wasn't actually, didn't expect it to run that role or that task and so forth, it's very good. And then when you're happy with that, you can do things like dry running. You can say, I want you to run this against all my inventory, but I want you to use check and diff, and it will, it will run through as if it was going to make all those changes, and it will report back what changes it would have made, but it won't make, and it will just report back and tell you uh, what it would have done if you had said, don't check. Okay. And you know, you can, and another good thing is in your inventory is if you use a virtual machine alongside live inventory is to have a local group and run them on your local group uh, initially so that you know you can, the syntax is fine, it looks like it's great, 
does it actually work on my virtual machine? If it does, then okay, I'm going to run it on. Um, and that, yeah, that's most useful when you're doing, um, you know, building your playbooks for the first time. Basic security issues. I'm just going to run through a couple of most of these. You know, you want your first five playbook roll that's going to happen. The clock's ticking. People are already attacking your server. You've only just received the email with the root password in it, right? You want to lock down SSH. You want to create users and groups that you want. You want to limit um, access. Don't allow root access, don't allow password access, limit only users from allowed groups um, to log onto your server. You want to make sure that your packages, that your, you know, your, your uh, distri distribution is up to date. You might want to um, make sure that unattended app, um, updates for security are applied so that you don't have to keep remembering or wondering when you go back there that you haven't actually applied updates to app, uh, get update or what have you. You want to do things like configure the host name, you want to configure IP tables to lock it down, You're, you might want to configure rule, um, things like fail to ban to make sure that um, any brute force attempts against SSH or those sorts of things are, are, are stopped. Yeah, that's a lot of work, right? So you want to take what we do, we're going to research each one of those things. How do I, lock, how do I harden SSH? How do I harden Apache? How do I write IP tables rules, right? And you, you, you take that knowledge just once. You used to do it a lot every time you build a server. You do it once and you look at your notes that you had before the different server builds and you start creating templates and variables that you can apply consistently across your infrastructure. You build tasks to implement, make sure they're idle potent. You put them in version control and then it's all documented. And then you've got a playbook that you can call your first five and you can run that as soon as you've got the IP address of a new server. You just drop that in your host inventory, run your playbook, and that server is immediately secured. So let's look at an example of that. We're going to a very, very quick example of how we're going to harden SSH. So, sorry, not the example, but typically SSH runs using a configuration file that tells you what port it's going to use, what protocol, what address you're going to listen on, whether you're using privilege separation, what uh, level of encryption you're going to use for the key, so forth, and that sort of thing, right? So you take that and you say, well, okay, I'm going to say this is Ansible Managed, so if anyone looks at it on the server, they can see that they shouldn't be editing it. I might want to configure the port. I might want to configure um, the login grace time so that brute force attacks are harder to do. I might want to increase the encryption of server. I might want to, you know, variable parameterize those sorts of things. And so I'll create a variable file that will specify those things. The server port I want to use is some random port. Um, you know, whether I allow um, X over for TCP forwarding or what the max startup time and you know certain things that you've learned from reading about how to harden SSH. You parameterize those sort of things. And then you just create a simple role, which says take that template that we've got there, run it through the variables that we specified there. That's a template, that's where I want it to be. I'll back up the one that's there in case I've made a real dog's breakfast with it. And uh, when I've done that, I want to restart SSH. Right. That's pretty straightforward, right? So when you've got a new server, you just go harden SSH and it's done. And you don't have to remember all those things and go in there and start editing configuration files, which you edit and save, and nothing works. You think, oh, what was it again? <laughs> right? So it's in here. You know what it is. It's backed up. It's in version control, and you can just run it again. So a typical uh, first five role that we use, you know, I've got a role that says, okay, as a pre-task, you can write pre and post-task, but pre-task here, before you do anything, I want you to make sure the distro is up to date. I want you to cache it for an hour so I don't keep updating it every time I do something. Okay? Upgrade it. Upgrade the distribution. You don't know the server you've got. You know, their, what their puppet image that they built your server originally for, or, you know, how old that was. And then just run through the roles. And it's got some base roles, which will do some things like setting host names, maybe, setting, um, you know, set basic users, set a, a network time protocol so that use the, all your servers use the, name, the same name server, uh, the same time service, so that they're all, their clocks are all in sync. Harden SSH, and install things like fail to ban, or log watch, or mailing program, or so forth. And you might then want to do things like uh, set up the firewall. Typically, though, why not just use somebody else's module for doing that? Don't, you don't have to rewrite these things. Most of these things will have good roles that you can get from Galaxy to do that. Right? So don't reinvent the wheel. Get these things. Have a look at them. Make sure they do what you want them to do. Make sure that they, that they parameterize the way you want them to do. And just to show you the power of that, if you use Galaxy roles, you can build a whole lamp stack in six lines. Six lines, right? You can say, oh, my, my SQL, Apache, PHP. So, you know. If you use, if you use uh, roles, very, very quick. Another example of how to use, um, here we're going to look at um, the Poodle. Um, Poodle is an SSL uh, downgrade attack. So we're going to use line in file, we're going to go to the SSL configuration, we're going to swap out the line that says these are the protocols 
Um, I use, and I'm saying don't use version 2 and don't use version 3, and so the, the, the server exploit that uses a, what we call poodle attack is no longer um, something. Okay, you have a, another, I'll, I'll gloss over, that's just another way of doing it depending on how you set up that. Okay, so now let's look at Drupal, right? We want to do, we we're talking, supposed to be talking about Drupal. So you could do the same thing. You could say, I've got an inventory which describes all of my Drupal sites. I've got tasks that I want to apply a particular patch, like Drupal Get the Patch or something like that. I, want, I might have tasks to test for the vulnerability across all my servers, and I'm going to reuse that. I'm going to do it in a way that I could just have a file that I just pop patches in, or, or pop the location of the patch in, and it would run against, my, um, against all my Drupal sites. So here's, here's, here's the, the outline of a, a role to do that. And here's a, a task that does that. Here's an inventory which says, uh, this, this is the machine, this is where the web route is, these are my Drupal sites, these are the dot routes of my Drupal sites. And I've got a Drupal 7 patch here, it's going to use a module called get URL, it's going to go and get the URL, it's going to go and get the patch from uh, D.O. It's going to put it in the temporary directory on the server, and then it's going to apply the patch, iterating through all of my Drupal sites. That's one of the powerful things here, you can say with items, and it's uh, you know, for each on the variables that you've assigned your Drupal sites. And so, you know, in that many lines, we can, we could, you know, we could have secured. So on October the 15th or whatever it was, when the security advisory came out, you could have just dropped the patch in here or updated this to use the right patch, run it, and you know, all your Drupal sites would have been patched within however long it took to, to do that <laughs> and run it, right, not long. Um, and you could say, oh, but I also need to upgrade an old Drupal 6 site of mine with a, with a patch that does um, DB, TNG, um, and so you can do the same thing. You patch all your Drupal sites um, in a few lines. Um, when you're looking at Ansible, and have, you know, there's lots of things. I've just covered basic Drupal security. I'm also things you should describe to the, the security bulletins to make sure that you know about these things. Following key people on Twitter is a really useful one as well, because you know, they, although a security bulletin comes out, Twitter will, people on Twitter will say, you should be doing this right now. Right? You might plan to do it tomorrow. Um, harden all your Drupal installations. Definitely use version control so that you can see if anything changed. Um, leave Wednesday nights free, right? That's when. <laughs> that's when. That's when the grief starts. You know, if you do any regular things on Wednesday, think about that. Um, I'm going to gloss over this because we're running a bit through time. Um, get a static IP is a really useful one. I, mean, I don't know how many people do that, but if you use a static IP, then you can lock your service right down, right? You can put an IP table rules on all the things you don't want people to access to, um, to only the IP addresses you want, and that stops a lot of this. Um, if you disallow access to um, any text files other than um, the index.php and your robots.txt file, a lot of the vulnerabilities that things like the Drupal get and patch enable people to put in back doors wouldn't have affected you necessarily. It's not the, sort of an only solution. But a lot of those things relied on people having the ability to run PHP on your server. Now, the only PHP file you need to allow people to run on your server is index.php, right? And you don't need, no one needs to have access to anything else. And you can password protect anything else. So if there is anything else you want to run, like upgrade or update or XML or RPC or something, you can, you can password protect that and give yourself access to it. And the other thing, obviously, thing, restrict file permissions. It's, you know, it's alarming how often people's file permissions are far too relaxed and it's very little public access required for any files on a Drupal site, right? You, you need to allow the, the web server to be able to read and, and write certain files under certain circumstances, but you don't really need anyone else to have any access to it. Just so you know, if you migrate from things to vhost, it's all, I'll just gloss over this, this is about uh, always checking your configuration before you rerun it, but I'll, I'll worry about that. The other thing is reviewing your logs. Um, you need to know what's going on in your server, and so you need to review your logs um, often, one of the things that I think is quite useful if you find your logs are very verbose is you can start putting in conditional logging in your vhost files and say, I don't want you to log all my static resources, I want you to just log page accesses and other, other accesses so that your logs are more succinct. So if you're using something like grep or something like that to go through your logs, they're not full of you know, hundreds and hundreds of requests when you're only interested in the, the request for the page that was requested. But you need to do that. Optionally, you might want to say, well, I want to turn it on and off for certain things because I want to know why the CSS isn't working. So that's just something to over that. Using things like mod, mod security makes it much easier with Ansible. You can start optionalizing certain rules. So if anyone here uses mod security, it gives you a sort of much more control over um, you know, how you apply exclusions to mod security across all of your servers. You don't have to go and do that individually on each one. Um, using things like fail to ban, 
IP table whitelists and removing un unused servers. Then when, when you look at log analysis, you know, if you really want serious about log analysis, then it's quite worth looking at some of the services that will do log aggregation and summarization of your logs, because it is, you know, it's a hard thing to do regularly by hand. Um, so what can we use Ansible for Drupal for, right? We can write tasks to do a lot of different things. And things, you know, I mean, whatever you might consider, we might say, well, well I, this isn't something we would do, but you might, you might want a, 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 a role ready to put all your sites into maintenance mode. If you suddenly said it was a security issue, you just need all your sites to go into maintenance mode. There are better ways of doing it, I think, and that is, having a maintenance mode site that you can redirect all your traffic to so that you can still use your Drupal site, but you know, it's something that some people might want to do. You might use uh, Ansible for um, continuous in integration for pulling latest changes to um, dev sites <coughs> using Git hooks and, and that's what we were talking about the other day. Um, and using, uh, thinking about using it in harmony with Drush, so you can call Drush commands with Ansible. Now one of the things that you know, I would like to be able to say right now, and I can't, is that it works well with things like Drush. But we should start looking as a community about maybe building Drush submodels to return things like JSON that Ansible can understand so that we can start writing Ansible tasks and those sorts of things to say, you know, install this module. And then Drush will say, I don't need to. And say it in JSON so that Ansible goes change equals false. You know, you know what I mean? And so it's not just using shell commands just to run Drush commands, but it starts getting information back that is useful within the context of your paper. Um, and again, if all this is too much, then consider a platform for you and we'll um, do that for you. So I'm just going to run through, if I've got time, a really simple example. So the use case here is, say you've got a commerce site, and um, <coughs> it says, I've got an updated image for you know, this t-shirt, or what have you. Okay, that's not a big deal, right? They say, I've got an update for all 10,000 t-shirts. It's uh, a big deal. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to go to the server, overwrite the image that you use for that thing. Um, and then, of course, all your image styles, all your image caches. I mean, what do you do? Flush the whole image cache for the whole thing? It's a bit of a pain if you're only updating one image, right? Um, clearing the image cache styles and so forth. So, a really simple example. All we need to do, define our hosts, define our Drupal sites, create a role called update images, and then write um, some variables. <coughs> so, this is the path of the local images. These are the images I want you to update. This is where they're going to go. These are the image cache styles that I'm not going to update. There's a handler which says that because I've updated um, these sort of things, I might want to clear Drupal cache. So using with items for all my Drupal sites, go and run um, clear cache. I'd like to see greater integration you know, and looking at writing integrations with Drush aliases, for example, as well, and you know, where, where the crossover between Ansible and using Drush is an interesting topic of conversation. I think we, you know, as a community, we look at. And then the, the, the simple role using a great command called with nested, which enables you to write not, we, we looked at with items before, right? So with items went through all our Drupal sites. With nested does a cross join effectively of those two dictionary variables. It will say for all your Drupal sites and for all your files to update, just use the copy module and go and put the source file in the destination file. Okay, so that's great. That's, that's handy for one file, right? Of 10,000, that's, that's great. And then for the updating of the cache, you say, well, I've got a list of Drupal sites, I've got a list of the image cache folders, and I've got a list of images I want to update. So, for each, so you can drop the individual style cache for that particular image running through all those images just by going to the image style cache path for that file and making sure it's absent. Right? So state equals absent says, go there, see if it's there, and remove it. And that's sort of a parallel array sort of deal. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And it's, it's like a, in SQL, it'd be a cross join. So it says for, you know, for everything in there, and everything in there, and everything in there, the whole uh, full permutation of all those different things. So what's useful was that, so if when we patched, um, I mean, in a Drupal Geddon context, the way that I actually did that was as soon as security came out, I actually did it through Git and did Git pulls onto the server. But then I had to update you know, all our devs and all our staging and all these things that weren't publicly accessible. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll write that Drupal. And you know, using Jeff's example, he did a similar thing. I mean, it's one of those annoying things when you're patching a Drupal site and someone tweets, oh, I've done it. Once I'd patched all my um, live production sites, I thought, okay, well, I'll do that. And took his example and used things like with Nested to go and do that, and then updated and patched all of our dev sites and all of our staging sites. and. And so, you know, and that's work up front, right? And once you've done that work up front, it's there for you. Have your inventory set. All your Drupal sites are now known by Ansible. And all you really have to do is write these sorts of 
few lines to do things that um, you typically want to do in Drupal. Uh, so, to, you know, just to see it running, you go through there, it runs through, goes through all of the individual files. Strange example, in this case it says I didn't need, I didn't need to change it, this one it said I did need to change it. And then it goes through and um, updates the cache, it runs that role. And at the very end it says, it tells you in summary what it did. It says, yeah, two roles that I, or two, two roles that I did, the update the image cache and the update the image, they were okay, and two of them changed. Now that's at the role level, not at the individual kind of iterative task level. It says there's something in that role that changed. That's why the log's quite good, because sometimes you think, really, that shouldn't have done. <laughs> and you go through the logs and, 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 and find that. And you can, you know, now, okay, so we're gonna try and automate this. Now, I don't actually use this, but it's, um, it's something I do intend to have a look at at some point. But Ansible have a, a, a paid for product, although it is free, uh, free for less than 10 nodes that enables you to automate playbook runs, it enables you to share and control the permissions of playbook runs, it enables you to control and access permissions so you can say, I allow these members of my team to run these playbooks but not against production servers or you know, and so forth. So it's a, a GUI, effectively a web-based GUI that you can install on a virtual machine and give team access to that. So it's something that, you know, if you, if you are doing this a lot and you are managing a lot of servers, especially if you want scheduled runs, what if you wanted this thing, sorry, well, ad hoc commands, right? But what if you've got tasks that you say, I want you to do this, you know, Every night, every hour, or whatever. That, that's, that's, that's the way that you can do that. Some useful tools I've found, things like when you're going through your logs, you might want to <coughs> decipher the payloads for posts that have uh, security issues in it. Sort of good, getting good Unicode and, and uh, PHP decoding tools that you can start understanding what the payload tools are, that, you know, and that sort of thing. And things like getting under, really understanding permissions for file permissions and online calculators really you know, stops you having to keep all that in your head. You can be really sure that you're setting permissions for everything, those sorts of things. And side masks for blocking groups of things. They're just sort of nerdy tools that you might want to have access to. Right, so if you're doing it for local, shout out for Vlad. I'm very good shout out. Right? <laughs> Use Vlad for local development. Um, it's great. If you want to read about stuff, which, you know, this is, this is an excellent book. I've seen the first three chapters of the preview edition, that's also an excellent book. But read this book, it's really, really good, and it will answer all your questions. There's a voucher to give you 30%, 33% off, okay? Head to the main page theater after, uh, after all the questions. But before you do that, I'm not gonna model it, but should you want to go Egyptless? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ansible up and running. If you're, they took the subtitle from the Vagrant up and running book. Ah, yeah. <laughs> and if, you, uh, if you're not a t-shirt kind of person, or if you're a sticker kind of person, I have stickers and badges. That's what I've got. What have you got? Any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, one thing that you, uh, you touched on in your talk that I think really bears emphasising, so I think it's one of the most compelling things about using Ansible is if you have a, a server compromise, one of the real standard pieces of advice is rebuild everything, mm. restore from back, and yeah. go from scratch. And yeah. That's been a very onerous task for a lot of the yeah, servers, yeah. and traditionally people tend to just try and patch, clean up, and move them up along. Yeah, yeah. Ansible means that you can just hit a button, get yeah, your environment up and running, that's, and very quickly yeah. um, do that cleaning. Really I mean, that, that is you know, the, the change for me, right, as an individual human, was that it made me so less precious about servers I manage. Yeah. You know, and it's so, why, why would you, why, you know, if, if you thought that your server in any way, was wonkified, why, why would you waste your time going in there? I mean, you might want to keep it so that you can go and forensically figure out what was going on. But you know, if all your code is in GitHub and if all your data, and the only thing that really is an issue in all that is your database backups. Right? Everything else is scriptable and you can build your environment, you get another server up and running, well, and the DNS, right? You've got to change the, the DNS to point to your new server. And then it gives you, buys you the time to go, and if you should care, what happened on that thing. Whereas, yeah, you know, and the days of going in there and thinking, oh my god, you know, how do I... And also, if you've got two servers, um, another, another sort of practical one was that, you know, they may differ, right? You, th you thought you built them the same, but they're, they're out there in the wild, and there's some subtle difference between those two sort of things. And you, you can't diff a whole server. Yeah. But you just, you know, why, why waste your time with it? <clears throat> Build one another one. So, well, that's, this, that's not the way I want it. That's the way I want it. So, yeah. And, you know, and with things like DigitalOcean, and, and I didn't go into this at all, but, you know, there's lots of really good examples. It's, it's madly easy to spin things up using Ansible on DigitalOcean. You can build as many things as you want and destroy them straight away. You know, 
cost you a quid for a, <laughs> an hour to keep this thing alive. So you, you start really being able to real world test without it being like a major hassle to build a server. And it's, uh, you suddenly know, you know, you're not precious about your service anymore. You're more precious about the security and everything else, code and everything else is taken care of by Git and so forth. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. From a workflow perspective, do you, do you manage your Ansible scripts on like a site by on a project by project basis? Um, some. I, that's something you know that um, we're sort of building best practices really. Mm. Um, I've got some um, certainly the security ones and my base server build. I have an inventory for all of our servers in in one um, because I don't want to, you know because the, I don't want that functionality to be different when I do it on these different servers. Mm. But there are certainly um, project-based playbooks that I do for like commerce sites for updating project images, which you know, f relevant for that, they probably only have an entry specific to a particular project. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine it also kind of depends on the providers, because if certain providers have different entry requirements. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, one of the, one of the classic questions, I guess, in in terms of Ansible is that although it's highly potent and you run it again and again, mm -hmm. is that typically you will have certain playbooks that you run once the first time because you're going to run them as root, because first off, there isn't an Ansible user on the server, right? So, so your first build, the first time you run your first build, you'll run it as root, and from mm -hmm. then on, you'll run it as Ansible. So, yeah, there will be different, you know, playbooks will have a kind of different perspective in terms of yeah. the hosting provider, whether they need to be run regularly, or, you know, whether you can just run them again and again. So, yeah. But I think, I'm not, my, my take home there would be that I think Ansible needs to work with the way that you work, not you know, you necessarily change the way that you work to, to use mm -hmm. Ansible, and it depends on a whole range of things, whether you're using Jenkins or whether you're using continu you know, continuous integration or with, whether you're using Git or Bitbucket or DigitalOcean or Rackspace. You know, there will be ways, and I don't think there's one size fits all. I just think it's a great tool for mm -hmm. fitting into the way that you want to work with what you've got. Yeah. Yeah. Is that it? Blimey. Okay, well, last talk of the day. I've had a really amazing weekend, so Personally, I'd like to thank the guys for everyone who organized this weekend. And as a group, we need to hear the lecture data so we can thank them as a group. Thank you very much. <laughs> cool.